title of my message this morning is Peace in Uncertainty. Peace in Uncertainty. How many of you would be willing to say this morning with the show of hands that you could use some peace in your life today? Yeah. I think that a lot of us feel the uncertainty of the times in which we live, whether that's personally or on a broader scale. And and so peace is something that we really value. Peace is something that we truly desire. And yet how many of you have found, like I have, that so many times when we're going through times of uncertainty, our response is to say things to ourselves like, I just don't understand. Can any of you relate to that? You're going through something, perhaps a difficulty or struggle, and you find that your response is, I don't understand. Anybody say that to yourselves? And you find yourselves on this path, the drive and desire to understand. We want to understand, especially in times of uncertainty. But here's what I think Paul will help us with tremendously this morning through his letter to the Philippians, that what we need to understand is that it's often our drive to understand things that steals our peace. That's often a path that we go down that leaves us feeling the very opposite thing that we're so desiring. We want peace, but we're trying to understand. And so Paul's gonna point us in the direction of a, of a true peace that holds up and can't be taken away, even in times of uncertainty. Paul's writing to the Philippians and he wants them to be free from anxiety. Notice that's what he said in verse six. Be anxious about nothing. Don't be anxious about anything. This is Paul's desire for them. He wants them to be free from that kind of nervous irritation and gnawing feeling that tears at our hearts, that obscures our view, that makes it hard for us to see and do wise things. Anxiety clouds so much of what we go through in life. And I don't think we have to convince any of us. I don't think we have to convince anyone, especially who suffers from anxiety, why it's a bad thing. I think we all could agree that that anxiety is an awful feeling, and yet it's something very, very prevalent in our day. And the encouragement that I want to bring today is not to convince you why anxiety is bad, but that it's actually possible to be free from anxiety. In other words, Paul's encouragement to be anxious about nothing is not an impossible thing that he's asking. I want you just to think about that this morning because it's a familiar verse in verse six when Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. But I think if a lot of us are honest, we would walk away from a statement like that and say, well, it sounds nice, but come on, really? Is that really realistic for someone to come along and say, don't be anxious? Is this an unreachable idea? How can we be expected to face all the things that we face with all the weaknesses and limitations that we have and not be anxious? How how can we really help it? And fortunately, Paul is going to give us some really specific things that we can do that if we'll be faithful will result in a real and true freedom from anxiety that's replaced by a powerful peace. And you'll be glad to know that Paul doesn't just say, stop it. And he doesn't just say, cheer up. But he has some real things that we can grab onto, and I wanna look at those with you, at least six things for those of us that are desiring peace in uncertain times, perhaps those of us who struggle with anxiety, as many, many do. Before we look at the things, I want to look first for just a moment at Paul's qualifications to even be the guy that says this. Because we live in a day where a lot of times our attitude towards what's being said 
doesn't have to do with the truth or the content, but we look at the messenger and, and we say, well, what right do you have to be the one that speaks about that? And so let's ask ourselves that question. What right does Paul have to be the one that comes along and says, don't be anxious about anything? First of all, and for starters, let's just remind ourselves that Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's been called uniquely anointed and divinely inspired to deliver, deliver the message of God to his people. Don't forget that. Paul speaks with an authority that, in a sense, the average person doesn't have because he's been uniquely commissioned by God in this way. These words carry the weight of apostolic authority, at least for the followers of Christ, for those who call themselves Christians and for the church. But beyond that, let's think for just a moment about Paul's experience. It's not just that he's called to be an apostle. I mean, that has some considerable weight to it. But where is Paul writing the letter to the Philippians from? Anybody remember? Prison. He's in prison. Not just any prison, Paul's a prisoner in Rome, and he's endured incredible hardships, and he now is facing perhaps the greatest hardship in his life to this point, because once the iron fist of Rome took hold of you, it typically wouldn't let go without drawing blood. So Paul's in a bad spot. He's expecting his trial which may very well result in his death. To say that Paul is in a season of uncertainty in his life is to massively understate where he's at. In prison, facing trial that will most likely result in his death. Everything about Paul's life and everything about Paul's future at this point is uncertain. But here's a man who in the crisis of his life, under immense pressure, is writing to the church at Philippi with these words, don't be anxious. Do you think these words come with a little bit of credibility? When the Philippians have watched what Paul's gone through? See, it's one thing for prospering people that have very little trouble in their lives to give advice to others who are suffering. But that's not Paul. Paul could put the difficulties he's endured side by side with anyone. And I think in terms of suffering, hardly anyone's resume would measure up to Paul. And yet this is the man that says, don't be anxious about anything. No doubt the Philippians would have received Paul's words with a great deal of weight, not only because he was an apostle and because of his calling, but because of what they had watched him experience and endure. He was an expert on the subject of living in uncertainty and suffering, and yet he's the one that's saying, don't be anxious. So <clears throat> let's look, though, <clears throat> together at Paul's prescription for peace. Because again, I think that you'll be encouraged to know that the extent of it is not just that Paul writes and says, hey, knock it off. He doesn't just say, stop it. He doesn't just say, close your eyes and pretend that your problems aren't there. He doesn't just say, think you know, happy thoughts and try to focus on the positive. He doesn't say, ignore your troubles, which, by the way, seems to be the advice of so many people when it comes to anxiety and uncertainty. But that's, that's not Paul's approach. Instead, he counsels with wisdom and with clarity. And it's, if you look at it, and we're going to look at it, it's kind of like, it's like if you, if you went to someone and said, hey, I want to be healthy. What should I do to be healthy? And you would realize that the answer to that question would be multifaceted, right? It would have to do with your diet. It would have to do with exercise. It would have to do with how much sleep you're getting. It would have to do with your relationships. It would have to do with all these different facets of your life to really 
pursue a healthy life. And in a similar way, for someone to come along and say, what do I need to do for peace? Paul's not just going to say, well, you know, starve yourself, and once you lose weight, you'll be healthy. He's not talking about a fad diet or one of my favorites, you know, the belt that just punches you in the stomach while you watch TV. That's how you get abs. Don't you wish that actually worked? That's not the kind of approach that Paul has. It's a very holistic approach that Paul takes, and that's why we're going to look at six things, six things for the people that say, I want peace in my life. The result of growing in these things, in cultivating a condition of life, the result of this will be peace. So let's look at these together. Some of them we'll just mention because they make sense on the surface. Some of them we'll dive a little deeper into with the time that we have. But the first thing, if you're taking notes, is found in verse 4. What, what's, what's the prescription for peace? Number one, remember to rejoice. Remember to rejoice. Paul says here in Philippians 4 and in verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Why do you think he says it again? Do you think it's because our tendency might be to say rejoice? Yeah, 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 but I got real problems that I, no, 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 listen again, rejoice. Would you agree with me that for a lot of us, that's the part we forget to do? Some people tell it to us like this, which I think mirrors this counsel from Paul. Don't forget to celebrate the victory. So often what we do is when a victory comes, we think, yeah, that's how it should be. I want to be winning. And all we focus on is the losses. When something goes wrong, when something falls short, we're always looking for perfection. We're trying to fix the problem. And so our lives become one nonstop giant focus on wherever there's anything wrong that needs to be fixed. And here's, here's the news flash, I think, for a lot of us, there's always going to be something to work on, right? Isn't that what Paul said already in chapter 3? Even as an apostle with the calling that he had, he said, it's not that I've already attained. I haven't reached some level of perfection that I'm just sort of at this cruising altitude, free from all the turbulence. There's always going to be something that comes up. There's always going to be a new obstacle, a new issue to solve, something else to deal with. So don't forget when the time is right and when the victories come, don't forget to take the time to rejoice. I think your peace may very well come from remembering that while there are problems, there are also great victories. And maybe the problems wouldn't seem quite as big as they've seemed if we would remember to also celebrate the victories. If we would remind ourselves, yes, I'm in this struggle. Yes, I'm going through this difficulty. But let me rejoice in the things that God has already brought me through. Do you see the shift in perspective? I think peace is cultivated and grows out of the conditions of the heart that knows how to rejoice. So Paul says, rejoice. And don't forget how he says it. <laughs> he says, rejoice in the Lord when? Always. Always. When? Always. Always. <laughs> and again, I say, rejoice. I think that pretty much covers it, right? Well, secondly... When it comes to peace, not only should we remember to rejoice, but we should pray and give thanks. Look at what Paul says again in verse 6. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, not only should you rejoice, but in everything, learn to pray and make supplication with thanksgiving, letting your requests be known to God. If we don't learn, someone once said, to pray about everything, we will worry about it. I think it was Martin Luther that said the mind and the heart of a man are like two giant millstones. And if you don't put something in between them, they'll just grind the surface off one another. And so the question is, 
with those cares, with those worries, with those things that we're going through, are we learning to put prayer in the works? Prayer is so much more, and I think this is worth thinking about for a moment. Prayer is so much more than asking God for what we want. I think some of us, when we're looking for peace, we limit our seeking of peace with God, especially in our prayer life, for asking God for something specific. Well, God, if you do this, I'll be at peace. But have we yet begun to discover that prayer is more than just asking God for what we want? There's a deeper communion where prayer becomes the soul of a man or a woman seeking after God, where there's a communion and a finding God where we sit and we look upon God in his goodness and power and whether or not he's doing what we want him to, we realize there's a greater function to prayer. What is it? It's what connects us to him. The true purpose of prayer is to unite us to God. It's not simply to get what we want accomplished. And if we could grow in our understanding of prayer, I think that we would grow in our peace. Because again, I think a lot of us aren't experiencing the peace we want because we simply think prayer is getting God to do what I want him to. And if he doesn't, then I'm frustrated and I have no peace. God, when are you going to do what I want you to? And for those that would say, You know, Zach, I struggle with this because anxiety is a real thing. And I feel like the church's answer, right, there's sort of this cynical response in our day. Well, you're just going to tell us to read our Bibles and pray. Yes, without any apology or without any shame in that answer, that's what we're going to say. That God speaks a better word than the words that are rattling around in your heart and mind. God speaks peace to the storm, and prayer is what unites us with the one who has power to do something about the things that are going on in our life. So prayer is an important and powerful exercise in the pursuit of peace. There are, there are so many sort of vague and oppressive anxieties that come and, and they cast a shadow over our hearts. And I think the idea is that if we could learn to define them, if we could learn to put them into plain words, we would find that when they were hidden, they seemed a lot bigger than when they were brought out into the light. And so if you think about it, just to speak out and put into plain words our anxieties cuts them down to size. It's like the little kids' books that, you know, the eyeballs in the shadows. You know what I'm talking about? And that's so scary because it's it's vague, it's in the dark, I don't know what it is, it's spooky, but when it's brought out into the light, then we can see what it really is and we can address it for what it is. Just speaking our anxieties to a person is so helpful in putting them into perspective, even if the person that we're talking to can't do anything about it. And so here's here's the perspective I think that Paul's bringing. How much more does speaking our anxious thoughts and putting them into plain words to God who can do anything about anything, nothing is too hard for him, nothing is impossible, how much does that put into perspective the anxieties that we're carrying? See, it's a principle that Paul knows. And so he says, pray, learn to take your anxieties and not leave them vaguely in the shadows, but put them into plain words. Pray and make supplication to God and you'll cut them down to size in his presence. You'll find that very few of your fears can survive in the presence of an all-powerful God. And in his presence, there's peace. For if God is for us, who can be against us? And if we are with him, 
what should we fear? Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Of what should I be afraid? Paul says, pray. And then he says in verse eight, think about what you think about. (laughs) When it comes to peace, think about what you think about. I'll remind you this morning that your mind has a mind of its own. And so often there are thoughts going on when you wake up that you may wonder, where did that thought come from? You may be going to sleep and be incapable of turning your mind off at night and you ask yourself, where are these thoughts coming from? Your mind has a mind of its own. And so Paul's exhortation when it comes to the person that desires peace in their heart and their mind is think about what you're thinking about. And the beautiful thing is that Paul doesn't tell them, try to understand your circumstance. Remember, we went over that already. Our pursuit of understanding in our circumstances is often the very thing that steals our peace. Paul promises a peace that what? Surpasses understanding. This is an important distinction. Paul is not talking about a peace that comes from understanding. You and I are so often pursuing a peace that only comes from understanding the situation. If I can understand it, then I'll be at peace. Paul says, here's the peace of God that comes and surpasses your understanding. It is available to you right here and right now. But the encouragement is, think about what you think about. How does he say that in verse eight? He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Can I ask you? If you were to take an inventory of your thought life, What percentage of what you think about do you think would fit that list? What percentage of the things that you think about are pure? What percentage of the things that you think about are lovely and commendable and excellent and worthy of praise, honorable and just? See, I think a very real fight for a lot of us is We don't think about what we think about. In fact, the main goal for many of us is to not have to think about anything. So what do we do? Binge watch Netflix. So I don't have to think. Check out. Scroll on Instagram. We all do it, a lot of us, most of us. But what percentage of those things that we're just mindlessly combing through or mindlessly taking in What percentage of those things would you say are pure and just and honorable, commendable? Because make no mistake, those are the things that are filling your mind. My wife is a wonderful accountability partner in this thing. Because we all... We do anyways, I don't know, we all, I'll just speak for us. We, we like to get on these little tangents of a show we're watching. You know, sometimes we'll be getting to know someone, say, What's, what show are you watching right now? And my wife, I don't know, she just has a sensitive spirit, I think, sometimes. And so I'll want to watch shows that, you know, right before we go to bed, and she'll watch it and it just troubles her spirit. She says, I don't want to watch that anymore. And I'll think, you're right, so often you're right. This isn't commendable, this isn't pure, this isn't honorable. This isn't filling our minds with anything good and it ends up being the last thing we think about right before we go to sleep. Which very well may be why we wake up in the moods we do in the morning. Right, Paul says, don't be mindless. Think about what you think about and here's a list of things to be purposeful. Think about these things. But then he says in verse nine, fourthly, look at how you live. And I love this because it's so powerful. Paul's not just describing an inner peace, right? 
I think that's the extent of a lot of people's pursuit of peace. You know, just have inner peace. Just sit there and empty your mind and go inner peace and ring a bell or something. Light some incense. Paul says, that's not the way to peace in the real world. Look at the way that you live. How does he say that? Look at verse 9. He says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. What? Practice. Man, that's a, that's a shocker, I think, for those of us that would say, I want peace. How do I get peace in my life? You know what Paul's response would be? You got to start practicing. You can't just sit there and think about it. You can't just sit there and watch shows. Oh, you need to think about what you think about, but that can't be the end of it. You have to practice. You have to actually live this stuff out in real life if you want to experience peace. I think where the rubber really meets the road here in Philippians concerning this is Paul sets up this whole conversation about the peace of God guarding our hearts and minds by encouraging the church to get two women that are disagreeing to agree. So notice this. Paul doesn't write to Philippians, the church in Philippi, and say, hey, I know there's turmoil, I know there's relational difficulty, but just Empty your minds, ring the bell, light the incense, and find inner peace. He says, you, if you want peace, you're going to have to confront some things. If you want peace, you're going to have to face some of the conflict. Dear church, there's no way around this. And yet I think oftentimes we fool ourselves into thinking that peace will come from avoiding conflict. Peace will come from denying the existence of the troubles that are around us. Paul says that's not how peace works. You have to practice. You have to deal with things. And so Paul encourages them to look not just at what they're thinking about, but how they're living and to actually face those situations. Fifthly, he says, not only should we look at how we live and think about what we think about and pray and give thanks and remember to rejoice, but we should resist resentment. Man, that's a good encouragement. Where do we see it in the letter? Look at verse 10. Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have re revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now you have to know kind of the background behind what Paul is saying. Basically, Paul's been away for a long time. He's endured many hardships. He finds himself in prison and no one has really supported Paul, even though Paul has given so much to these churches. And Philippi was the one church that eventually and finally sent a financial gift and contribution. That's what brings about this letter to the Philippians. It's basically a thank you note with a whole bunch of extra stuff added in. But do you hear what Paul's saying with that backdrop? He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Think of Paul's perspective while he sat in prison and suffered what he did, and he could have built up resentment in his heart and said, no one's helping me. No one's supporting me. No one's there for me. But in Philippians, here as he closes out the letter, we actually get a glimpse of Paul's perspective. He resisted that temptation to be resentful and instead chose to believe the best and give the benefit of the doubt to the Philippians. What does he say? You were concerned for me. You just must not have had an opportunity to act on it. Church, can I challenge you this morning when it comes to peace, how much of our peace is being stolen by our resentment towards either wrongs that have been done to us or even imagined wrongs? We've made up stories in our heads that someone has wronged me. Well, the reason they haven't helped me is they don't care. And Paul is a man that can say, hey, don't be anxious 
Don't get all spun up. Don't get all worked up. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts and minds. And one of the ways that that happens is by resisting that resentment that can so easily build up. And then he says in verse 11, cultivate contentment. Cultivate contentment. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, he says, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Please notice that phrase. I have learned to be content. How do you learn to be content? Usually the way you learn to be content is the hard way. (laughs) You have to go through stuff to learn to be content. But I want to at least say this, because our time is quickly gone. Contentment is not a personality type and it's not a disposition that people are naturally born with. That's what we want to say. Well, that person's just more content. They just are naturally content. Contentment for Paul was something that he said, I had to learn. And so he learned contentment through the things that he went through. But as he cultivated contentment, what was the fruit of it? Peace. Whether I'm enjoying a whole lot of stuff or very little. Listen to what Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6. I think this is so helpful along these lines of contentment because he actually talks about this same idea in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Beginning in verse six, he says, godliness with contentment is great gain. And then watch this, for we brought nothing into this world. That's true, right? We brought nothing into this world and we cannot take anything out of this world. That's true. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. How many of you can say that? Don't raise your hand, it's rhetorical. (laughs) Most of us can't say that. If I have food and clothing, I'll be content. Paul says, if that's the attitude you can cultivate, it will be a great gain to you. He says, if we have food and clothing with these, we'll be content. But those who desire to be rich, ah, here's where so many of us fall. We fall into temptation, into a snare, a trap into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Please read that sentence again, slowly. What is it that's robbing our peace? A desire to be rich, a desire to have more harmful desires that have become a snare to us. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. It's a sad verse, isn't it? Maybe it would be such a help and encouragement for us to look around and say, the reason I don't have peace is not because of this or that or this or that, but it's because I'm carrying a desire that's piercing me. An unhelpful, harmful desire desire for something that can't actually in the end satisfy me anyways. Well, finally, I'll just add to the list of where peace comes from, Paul's prescription for peace. It's in the end something that's supernatural. Paul says in verse four, rejoice in the Lord. He says, the Lord is at hand. In verse nine, he says, and the God of peace will be with you. See, naturally we worry, naturally we're fearful, naturally we're anxious. But it's the presence of God that brings the power of peace that we're seeking. Paul says the peace of God guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And so here's the the picture I wanna leave you with. How deeply are you diving into your relationship with Jesus Christ? That's where peace is found, truly. 
These other things are, are great and have loads of wisdom embedded in them, but they all tie back to this singular idea of a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Paul says, the God of peace will be with you. I was reading about some men who were on a submarine and they were testing the submarine and they were way down in the depths of the ocean. And when they came up after a few weeks, someone asked one of them, man, what was it like being in the ocean when that huge violent storm hit? And their response was, what storm? We didn't even know it happened. Why? Because there's a certain depth you can go to in a submarine that puts you into a place that they call the cushion of the sea where the waves and the wind can't disturb. And I think that maybe here's, here's my, my, my best encouragement to you this morning. I think that some of us are sort of lingering in the shallows of our relationship with Jesus and we're wondering why we have no peace. My encouragement to you today is dive down deeper in that relationship. Be in the word. Learn to pray. Learn to give thanks. Learn to rejoice. Dive in deeply into that relationship with Jesus. And in knowing him, you will know peace. Amen? Yeah, amen. Okay. <laughs> Either you really like that, you're being polite, or you're like, how do we get this guy to be quiet? Let's start clapping, and maybe that'll cut him off. Like, that's the end, right? Oh, let's pray.